Welcome to our webinar on prostate cancer screening. Dr. Abu Asli and I have what we hope will be a very informative presentation for you. And uh, we have a lot of didactic information to share so we can understand what the prostate is, why screening is important, uh, next generation screening and the best way to do prostate biopsy and so forth. All of you are muted by design so we can prevent a free for all of questions. However, we welcome your questions. We will have time to answer many of them, depending upon how many there are. We may not get to all of them, but we'll certainly try and answer the most important ones. So please use the chat box to uh, share your questions. And if there's something pressing during one of the uh, presentations, we can stop and answer the question in real time. Otherwise, we'll try and answer them all at the very end. So. Let me begin by introducing Dr. Robert Abuasili, who's Director of Urology at Cleveland Clinic Fairview Hospital, and who is an Associate Professor at the Cleveland Clinic Learner College of Medicine. Take it away, Rob. Thank you, uh, Dr. Klein. Thank you so much for the uh, opportunity to, to speak tonight. Uh, and I know that the topic of this uh, session is on prostate cancer screening. So uh, I will give an overview of screening. Uh, and then uh, Dr. Klein will uh, give some specifics about what we're doing to improve screening uh, overall uh, nationally and as well as what we're doing specifically at the Cleveland Clinic. So I thought uh, I would start by first uh, talking about the prostate. So what, what is the prostate? And, and I thought it would be nice to show you a diagram of where it is located. So you can see here, uh, that the prostate is tucked under the bladder. Uh, it is just in front of the rectum, uh, which makes it easily accessible for uh, at least partial examination with the, with the fingers, which, which is what we do. Um, it is also just above the urinary uh, pelvic floor and, and sphincter mechanism. And this is important because uh, the location is, is tucked uh, around these vital structures. And so treatment of pr the prostate uh, does lead to some side effects. And so uh, we'll be talking about that uh, briefly in, in other talks uh, and later as well. So basically the prostate is a, is a reproductive organ. Uh, on average, it's about the size of a walnut. I mentioned uh, its location. And with age, there tends to be an enlargement of the prostate, uh, which we call BPH or benign prostatic hypertrophy. Uh, now this is a benign condition, which leads to uh, a blockage or obstruction of the urinary flow. Uh, but with respect to uh, prostate, uh, cancer screening, um, you know, uh, th th that is a, a separate topic. Uh, I mentioned that it's a reproductive organ and it, its main uh, goal is to, uh, main function is to contribute uh, volume to the ejaculate, uh, which is important to provide nutrients to the sperm and thus uh, aid in reproduction. And we know that prostate cancer is very common. It's actually, uh, estimated that about 165,000 new cases are diagnosed every year in the United States. Uh, and it's the second most common cause of cancer death among men in the US. It's estimated that a man's lifetime risk of prostate cancer is about one in six or approximately 16.7%. So it's very, a very common cancer. And about one of six of those men will uh, ulti ultimately uh, die of prostate cancer. Your overall risk of dying of prostate cancer in your lifetime is about 2.6%. Uh, and this reflects the fact that uh, prostate cancer in general is a fairly slow growing malignancy and most men will die with prostate cancer rather than of prostate cancer. That being said, the uh, risk of death is pr re uh, relative to the uh, stage of disease. In other words, if the disease is localized at diagnosis, the survival at five years is nearly 100%. Uh, if, if it's also still within the region of the, the prostate, so the surrounding areas, again, excellent survival at five years, 100%. Uh, but once it is outside of the uh, region of the prostate and other areas, such as the bones or the distant lymph nodes, 
you see that the chance of surviving at five years drops significantly, and it's estimated to be 30%. Again, hence the uh, importance of catching it early uh, when it's localized. Uh, this diagram shows the trends in prostate cancer death in the United States over the last several decades. And uh, the pink line here is prostate cancer. And you can see that the risk of dying of prostate cancer peaked in the early 1990s. But since then, there's been a gradual decline in prostate cancer death that we're observing in the United States. And so when you think about what could be contributing to the decreasing risk of dying of prostate cancer, uh, most people in the field believe that it's likely due to two main factors. Uh, prostate cancer screening, which was introduced uh, with the advent of PSA screening in the early 1990s. Uh, and that certainly, uh, at least there's a general uh, consensus that that has contributed to the decreasing mortality that we're observing and potentially that we're treating prostate cancer better. Uh, we have improved treatment options and I think we've learned a lot about the disease and so we've learned a lot about how to treat it. And, and so those two factors, I think, have been contributing to the observed uh, lower risk of dying of prostate cancer. Okay, all right, let's just go back here, right. Sorry, the slides are a little delayed, but let me see if I can get to the next slide. Right, so how do we screen for prostate cancer? Um, over the last uh, few decades, we've been using PSA, uh, and that is the main uh, way we're still doing it today, although uh, Dr. Klein will be talking about some newer tools that we have in our toolbox to try to uh, more uh, accurately uh, estimate the patient's risk of, of prostate cancer. So PSA, or prostate-specific antigen, was originally used to detect uh, recurrence after prostate treatment. Um, so as you may know, when the prostate is removed uh, uh, for the treatment of prostate cancer, the PSA is undetectable and it's a very good tool to detect for recurrence of cancer after treatment. However, uh, you know, we also use it for prostate cancer screening. Uh, the issue that arises is that PSA can be high from other causes, not simply from prostate cancer. So things such as BPH, which I mentioned, which is enlargement of the prostate with age, or prostatitis, which is an inflammation of the prostate, either due to infection or other causes, can cause the PSA to go up. So uh, a high PSA is not necessarily uh, due to prostate cancer. Um, but in the early 1990s, it was adopted as a, a widespread screening test. And uh, there were two large randomized studies that looked at whether prostate cancer screening affected uh, your risk of dying of prostate cancer. Uh, these uh, two large studies were originally uh, published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2009. And what they demonstrated, uh, at least uh, one of the two, so there was an American study and a European study. Uh, the American study uh, was difficult to interpret because at the time there was already a lot of screening happening. And so uh, the patients who were randomized to the uh, non-screening uh, group ended up getting screening a lot. So the, the results were difficult to interpret. But the European study uh, showed us that uh, what we saw was that prostate cancer screening using PSA decreased your risk of dying of prostate cancer by approximately 23 to 25%. So it did have a significant impact on the risk of dying of prostate cancer. So if prostate cancer screening improves your risk of dying of prostate cancer, why is there any controversy about uh, prostate cancer screening? Well, uh, screening, although has some benefits, also has some potential risks. Uh, for example, false positives. I mentioned that PSA can be elevated from other causes. And so we may be detecting things such as BPH or prostatitis uh, rather than prostate cancer. And this leads to uh, office uh, visits, uh, potentially prostate biopsies and the risks of prostate biopsy. Uh, and 
potentially detecting prostate cancers that would have otherwise not affected uh, the man during his lifetime, and uh, thus, you know, putting them uh, at risk for the, the side effects of treatment. Also, uh, once labeled with uh, cancer, that can have certain implications. Uh, there's also the associated anxiety and so psychological stressors associated with prostate cancer screening, uh, as well as the cost. Uh, I mentioned the risks of prostate biopsy. Uh, the risk, you know, traditionally we do prostate biopsy uh, transrectally, which means that we put the ultrasound through the rectum, and I showed you how the rectum is very close to the prostate, and then we would use a uh, biopsy gun to take samples of the prostate through the through the rectum. Uh, usually goes very well, but a small percentage of time uh, you can that can lead to uh, infection or sepsis, so spread of bacteria into the bloodstream, uh, which can be uh, occasionally serious and sometimes even life-threatening. Uh, and what we've seen is uh, with uh, the increased use of antibiotics over the last several years that uh, we've seen resistance to certain uh, antibiotics and uh, the antibiotics specifically that we used uh, to prevent infection during prostate biopsy, such as Cipro. And as Cipro resistance increased, what we noticed is that there was an increase in the risk of infection after prostate biopsy. So as a result, we've modified some of the antibiotics we use. And Dr. Klein will be talking about some of the newer approaches we have to prostate biopsy, which have a lower risk of infection. So again, uh, when you think about prostate cancer screening, you want to weigh the benefits uh, with the risks. Uh, and, and that's what this is all about. Uh, up uh, a few years ago, the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force looked at the risk benefits and decided that uh, for men aged 55 to 69, uh, they recommended the shared decision making between the patient and the provider uh, about the pros and cons of prostate cancer screening, uh, and that this discussion should be had before the decision for screening is is made. Uh, and then we have to incorporate, of course, the values and preferences uh, of the patient. Uh, and so they gave it a C recommendation. For older men, uh, usually over the age of 70 or with limited, uh, less than 10 year life expectancy, they do not recommend routine screening uh, for prostate cancer. The American Cancer Society uh, similarly recommends that men uh, should, should make an informed decision about screening. Uh, they recommend beginning at age 50, uh, but perhaps uh, younger, 40 to 45 for men at risk, particularly uh, men uh, who have family history of prostate cancer or maybe at higher risk uh, due to race, for example. Uh, they recommend screening with PSA blood test with or without the uh, digital rectal examination. And they also said that if your PSA is less than 2.5, that perhaps you don't need screening every year, that you may want to spread it out to every two years, potentially. And finally, the American Urological Association, again, very similarly recommends a shared decision making uh, for prostate cancer screening in men aged 55 to 69. Uh, and they recommended that the interval for screening can be individualized based on the uh, baseline PSA. So the lower the PSA, perhaps doesn't need to be repeated every year, maybe every other year or, or even less frequent than that. They recommend against screening for men under the age of 40, but uh, do recommend considering uh, screening for men age uh, 40 to 55 uh, if, if they have a family history of prostate cancer or African-American race, uh, but that this decision should be individualized and again, uh, does not recommend PSA screening in men over the age of 70 or with life expectancies less than 10 to 15 years. And that's all. And with that, I'll uh, pass it to Dr. Klein. Uh, as, as you all know, Dr. Klein is the professor and chair uh, at the Glickman Urological and Kidney Institute at the Cleveland Clinic and is a world expert in prostate cancer. And it's our honor to have him speak to us about the New Horizons in Prostate Cancer Screening and Biopsy. Thanks, Rob. That was a great overview. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, in our view, there should be no question that screening men at the appropriate age and with the appropriate risk factors which include primarily age, saves lives. There just isn't any question about that. And so there shouldn't be any controversy about screening. So 
Let me share with you some other things. Hang on for a second. There's just one little. There we go. Um, so Rob emphasized this, but I want to reemphasize it. The problem with PSA is that it's prostate specific, but not prostate cancer specific. And what I mean by that is that most men with an elevated P do not, in fact, have prostate cancer. And in fact, in most studies, PSA is no better than a coin flip or only slightly better than a coin flip in determining who has prostate cancer and who doesn't. So the downside to that is that in the past, we've ended up doing a lot of prostate biopsies on men who don't have prostate cancer. And we've also detected a lot of low-grade cancer that is not destined to hurt anybody that we'd rather not know about. And so it's we've felt that it's necessary for a decade or more now to develop newer ways to screen people that are better than PSA. And uh, there are a number of tests on the market that you may be aware of. Um, some of them are urine-based, like the MI prostate score, which came from the University of Michigan, and XODX prostate. And some are blood-based, OPCO 4K, and prostate health index. And all of these are better than PSA alone. There isn't any question about that. And when they are used as what we call a reflex test, meaning done in someone who has a worrisome or an elevated PSA, because of their improved specificity, we can avoid doing biopsies in lots of men that we would have otherwise, somewhere on the order of 30 to 35%. And all of the tests have a downside, just like PSA does, is that they all miss a certain percentage of high-grade cancers. And that's true for all screening tests across all cancers, mammography, colonoscopy, and so forth. No screening test is perfect in finding every cancer, but we accept this below a rate of below of about 10% as um, an acceptable trade-off for avoiding biopsy in about a third of men. Now, in, in the recent years, we've been working with a local company called Cleveland Diagnostics that has developed um, a new test for screening for prostate cancer that we're quite excited about. It's called ISO-PSA. <clears throat> All the current assays for PSA, so that includes PSA itself, free PSA, OPCO 4K, and prostate health index, measure the concentration of PSA in the blood. But ISO-PSA measures something fundamentally different, and it measures the ratio of abnormal proteins that are made by cancer cells to normal proteins, and these are PSA-based proteins. And the issue is this, cancer cells have disordered metabolism, and they make abnormal PSA molecules, and there are dozens of abnormal PSA molecules in the bloodstream of patients who have prostate cancer. The currently available tests, total PSA, free PSA, OPCO 4K, and prostate health index, only measure a couple of those molecules, whereas ISO-PSA measures the presence of all of them without having to know what they are. And so the way it works is that you, um, with ISO-PSA, you, you have your blood drawn, and it's sent to the lab, and it's dropped into what's called an aqueous phase solvent, and I won't go into uh, detail on that. But you can see here in the cartoon that it separates the cancer-related red triangles from the normal proteins. And when you look at the ratio of the molecules that are in what's called the top phase here, the blue aqueous phase here, you can come up with a ratio that predicts the presence not only of cancer, but more importantly, it predicts the presence of high-grade cancer. So Gleason's grade seven or Gleason grade group two cancers or higher. And those are the ones that we want to know about because we know that Many of those have the potential to grow and spread and threaten someone's life, whereas we don't want to know about the low-grade cancers because almost none of them will threaten someone's life. So that's how ISO-PSA works. And so we've done a number of studies. We've done a multi-center study of more than 1,000 patients that show how well it works. And it shows that unlike PSA, where a coin flip, it's not much better than a coin flip, ISO-PSA can overall, with about 81% accuracy, predict the presence of high-grade cancers. And we just have submitted for publication a 900-patient study that we did here just in Cleveland, where many of our advanced practice providers and physicians used the test. And what we found was that when we used ISO-PSA as a reflex in someone who had a worrisome PSA or an elevated PSA, 
we avoided biopsying 56% of men, which is better than the other tests that I showed you, which avoided about uh, a third of uh, men. Uh, with the same sort of um, miss rate for high-grade cancer, we miss high-grade cancer about 8% of the time with ISO-PSA, which is on a par with the others. And we also reduced the likelihood of recommending a magnetic resonance scan and MRI, which is very useful but a nuisance if you need to have one, by about 20%. So we think that this new test, ISO-PSA, has real clinical utility and um, is really going to change the way we screen for cancer. And here's how the result works. Again, ISO-PSA is not a, doesn't measure the concentration of PSA, but it measures this ratio. So we talk about a risk threshold or a ratio. And so if your ISO-PSA, if you have a PSA above four and you have an ISO-PSA, if the ISO-PSA ratio is less than six, you have a 92% negative predictive value for the absence of high-grade disease, meaning if you're, even if your PSA is above four, if your ISO-PSA threshold is below six, you have a 92% chance of not having high-grade cancer. And so generally speaking, we don't think those patients need a biopsy unless they have a really, really, really strong family history or some other reason to think they might actually have prostate cancer. On the other hand, if the ISO-PSA ratio or risk threshold is above six, you have about a 50-50 chance, a positive predictive value for having high grade cancer, grade seven or greater. And so generally, if you ask most urologists or even most men, if we told you you had a 50% chance of finding a high grade cancer, most urologists would recommend a biopsy. So this is the current screening paradigm as I see it. And I just wanna say that this is not necessarily accepted throughout the land of urology and uh, many people in our department um, have adopted this approach. This is what makes sense to me currently, is that if you have a worrisome or elevated total serum PSA, so that's above four, then the next step is this reflex test and ISO PSA. And if your ISO PSA is negative, generally we recommend that you be monitored. It might be a repeat PSA and digital rectal exam in six months. It might be in one year, depending upon other risk factors. On the other hand, if your ISO PSA is positive, meaning if the index is above six, so you have at least a 50-50 chance of high-grade cancer, then we go to a magnetic resonance scan, an MRI. And the reason we do that is that there's solid data and experience now that shows that MRI makes prostate biopsy better in the sense that it makes it more accurate. And so even if you, ha if you have a positive MRI, and I'll show you some pictures in a slide or two, of why MRI is useful in terms of doing targeted biopsies, then we would do what's called an MR ultrasound fusion biopsy, where we take the MR and port it into a console that's connected to our ultrasound machine. And then we put the ultrasound probe in the rectum and we get a live ultrasound image and we fuse the two of them together and we can mark the spot where we want a biopsy. On the other hand, we know that MRI misses about 20% of grade seven or higher cancers. It doesn't see everything. So if you have a positive ISO-PSA test that suggests at least a 50% chance of high-grade cancer and a negative MR, generally speaking, we're recommending what's called a template biopsy where we do random biopsies using a grid, like a battleship grid, the game battleship, overlaid from the prostate so we can sample everywhere. And in a fair number of patients, even though the MRI is negative, we do find cancer. So that is what I believe ought to be the current screening paradigm. Now, in other settings, you could substitute for ISO-PSA prostate health index or OPCO4K or one of the urinary-based tests. They're all fine tests. They're all better than PSA. Having said that, in our experience using ISO-PSA, we avoid biopsy in more than half the men. And using those other tests, biopsy is only avoided in about one-third of men. That's why I think ISO-PSA has more clinical utility. So then we come to the closing discussion here before we take your questions of how to biopsy a prostate. I'm sure that's been a, a, an issue for many of you. And I want you to consider, it's very confusing if you're, if you're not a cognoscenti on this, but um, you really need two things in addition to having a prostate. So that's a third thing you need. But you need some imaging, and then you need to decide how, how and where you're going to pass the needle. And these are two separate things. So all prostate biopsies are done at least with ultrasound. And in the best circumstance, they're done with ultrasound MRI fusion. So 
I personally believe that nobody should be biopsied or, or the very rare patient should be biopsied without an MRI. I think most everybody should have an MRI uh, before biopsy because the data is very clear that it's more accurate and allows us to detect the right kind of cancers. And then the needle can be passed through the rectum, which is the old way of doing it, or it can be passed through what's called the perineum, which is the area between the rectum and the testicles, the area that you sit on. And the reason that the transperineal approach is becoming more popular is that it is more accurate and it has a minimal risk of infection. Whereas with transrectal biopsy, in our experience, about half a percent of patients get an infection and they can be serious infections, bloodstream infections. Nationally, about two to 3% of patients get a, an infection after transrectal biopsy. So we are in the, in the middle of shifting almost every biopsy we do to a transperineal approach, and I'll show you the difference here. Now, this slide shows you a prostate ultrasound and a prostate MRI. They're not the same prostate, it's two different patients. But you can see the advantage to MRI here, even with the untrained eye. Ultrasound, the prostate, this thing right here, just looks like a big black blob, and you can't see much detail in it, and most cancers cannot be seen on ultrasound. On the other hand, MRI gives us great anatomic detail of the prostate, and it can show us other surrounding structures, but we can also see the cancers that you see in the red circle here. So for a typical prostate cancer, it will appear dark on MRI, and this allows us to identify a target that we cannot see on ultrasound usually. Uh, and the other thing that MRI can help us see are cancers that occur in the part of the prostate up here that's away from the rectum. This dark area here is the rectum. And we know that when we pass a needle transrectally this way, it's hard to hit this part of the prostate, and we often miss cancers that are hiding up here, in part because the needle doesn't go that far, and in part because even if we can push it in that far, the needle deflects. And so that's why MRI has an advantage over ultrasound. This is the old way of doing prostate biopsy. This is a transrectal biopsy with the patient either on their back or on their side. The ultrasound probe goes in the rectum here that you see here, and then the needle gets passed into the prostate. And again, using this approach, generally speaking, let me see if I can go back the slide here. Using the transrectal approach, again, this is the rectum down here, we can pretty well hit this part of the prostate where most cancers are. That's called the peripheral zone, but we can't hit up here. That's one of the challenges with it. And so, Various people, and I'll give credit to the folks at um, the National Institutes of Health, Peter Pinto and, and others there, Peter Troike, who have developed an MR-guided transperineal approach, where, again, the ultrasound probe goes in the rectum. That's the same for either approach, so we can get the live ultrasound of the prostate. But the needle goes through the skin anterior in front of the rectum and below the testicles. And that allows us to biopsy all parts of the prostate. So here you see the prostate in blue. We can biopsy this part near the rectum, but we also biopsy this part that's in front of the urethra. And we are doing these um, under uh, intravenous sedation and some under local anesthesia in patients like that because it's a little more comfortable than having a transrectal biopsy under anesthesia. So this is what ultrasound fusion looks like. And um, this is the green line here represents the outline of the prostate under ultrasound. And on this particular slide, it's fused with the MR image. So this is an MR image here. And so you can see that the a prostate lines up, the image of the prostate and the MRI line up very well, the green line with the black blob of the prostate at MRI. And our radiologist has marked where the worrisome tumor is. Here's the target. And so using sort of a virtual representation of this real-time image, we can pass the needle directly into this particular area that we think is worrisome for cancer. And the cylinders that you see here are the needle strikes. And this has improved the accuracy. And um, generally speaking for the average patient, a transrectal ultrasound MR fusion biopsy is the right way to go. Transrectal ultrasound. Again, our preference now is to pass the needle through the perineum rather than through the rectum. And finally, I wanna talk about the latest technology. So I've told you about the latest blood test, ISO-PSA, and our ability to do fusion images. 
This is the latest technology that actually Dr. Abuasili is our expert on. This is called micro ultrasound, and it's made by a company in Canada called ExactView. And this is standard ultrasound on steroids. It's three times more sensitive than a standard ultrasound probe is. And it allows us to see detail in the prostate just about as well as we can on MRI. So here is um, a slice of the prostate and here you can see a dark spot that looks like cancer, just like on the MRI I showed you a couple of slides ago. And biopsy of this particular area, targeted biopsy here, can be done transrectally or transperineally. And Dr. Abuasili has been our leader locally in showing, at least in some studies, that this technology, this micro ultrasound technology, is just about as good as MRI is. And so, while we're still learning how to use this that is very early days there may come a time in the not too distant future where um, we can do the transrectal ultrasound and the biopsy in the same sitting and do targeted biopsies just like we do with the mri fusion but not need to have the mri and that would be far more convenient for patients because MRIs have to be done at a separate sitting, and then they have to be interpreted, and then the patient has to come back for a biopsy. We are hopeful, we're not there yet, but we're hopeful that in the not too distant future, using a device like this, that if you need a prostate biopsy, you can be, you know, advise that in the office, come back on another day to have the biopsy, just have the micro ultrasound and the, and the transperineal biopsy done all in the same sitting without needing the MRI. So, we are happy to take your questions. I don't see anything in the chat box. And Dennis, I'm not sure that it's open. If you could open it now, please, so that we can hear people's questions. Uh, before we get there, um, and I'll leave this on the screen, if you want more information or to schedule an appointment, please visit clevelandclinic.org, prostate cancer care. And this will take you to our landing page that tells you about not only the things that we spoke about tonight, but many other things. And, uh, or you can call, 216-445-6246. We're happy to arrange an appointment for you to talk about these things directly. So with that, we will conclude the presentation and be happy to take questions. Again, I don't see anything in the chat box yet. Uh, thank you, Eric. That's a, that was a great overview of uh, some of the new technologies that are up and coming. There were, I believe, four questions submitted by email. Maybe we can go over those while people are entering their questions in the chat box. Perfect. Uh, the, the first question is, if my PSA is rising to just above four as a man in my 60s, are there steps that I can take to better assess my risk of prostate cancer before undergoing a biopsy? And I think you've shown this very well, that I think if, if this patient was in my clinic, I'd probably start, if their PSA was above four, to order the ISO PSA. If the ISO PSA was elevated, then we could uh, potentially order an MRI of the prostate. And depending on the results of the MRI, do, do either a, uh, a template biopsy or a MRI ultrasound uh, fusion biopsy. Uh, do you agree with that approach? Ab absolutely, yes. Uh, question number two, um, I've had PSA fluctuations over the last several uh, blood tests within the last year, uh, ranging from uh, 3.7 to 4.4. What do we know about uh, fluctuating PSA? Um, I think, uh, as we've mentioned, PSA, unfortunately, is not prostate cancer specific and so is affected by other conditions such as BPH or prostatitis. Uh, I think we do see fluctuations and in that range is actually a fairly uh, small range of fluctuation. We, we see uh, uh, fluctuations which are far greater, uh, particularly in men with uh, enlarged prostates uh, or recurrent prostatitis. Um, and so I believe this, this would be what you'd expect just from day-to-day -day fluctuations. And I don't know that uh, the fluctuations are important, so just the general trend of PSA over time and the absolute number, but maybe an ISO PSA in this situation, if the PSA remained above four, uh, might be of, of value. Uh, Eric, do you have anything to add? Nope, I agree with you completely. Excellent. Uh, question number three. Do we have any uh, specific risk statistics on the chance of infection from biopsy? 
as well as the chance of side effects from prostate removal. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, at least at the Cleveland Clinic, our uh, infection risk is estimated to be about a half a percent, uh, but nationally it's a little bit higher than that, uh, two to three percent, sometimes four percent, depending on the study you look at. Uh, and so that'll depend on the local uh, antibiotic resistance in, in the community and, and uh, other risk factors, uh, but that's roughly the, the risk of uh, biopsy if you're doing it transrectally. If you're doing it transperineally, the risk of infection is extremely, extremely low, uh, almost non-existent. Uh, and then the effect, uh, the side effects of prostate removal, that is a little harder to answer. I think it'll depend on several factors, uh, the disease that you have and whether uh, the uh, you're doing a nerve sparing procedure, non nerve sparing procedure, uh, and there are a number of side effects that men can experience after prostate removal. Uh, Another important factor I think that you want to consider is the experience of the surgeon, uh, as well as the, the overall uh, care that you're getting and uh, the more experienced the surgeon i think the the lower the these side effects uh will be um eric what do you what do you think about that question yeah so i'm sorry there's a helicopter flying over my office so let me let that pass before i answer it mm -hmm. yeah so you know people when when people ask about what the best way to treat their prostate cancer is, and we get that question frequently. They're really asking two questions, is which has the best cure rate and then which has the fewest side effects? And the answer is the three commonly used treatments of prostatectomy, external beam radiation, and brachytherapy all have equal cure rate, stage for stage, grade for grade. And the answer to the second question is which has the fewest side effects? The answer is none of the above. All treatments have side effects. And because the prostate is where it is, between the bladder and the urinary sphincter and is attached to the nerves that allow for erections, all of the treatments affect those functions to a varying degree. So if you have early stage prostate cancer that's contained within the prostate, an experienced surgeon can do nerve sparing surgery to help preserve erections. But even in the best of hands, the nerve bundles bruise easily and most patients don't get any erections for at least a few months after surgery and they heal gradually over 24 months with a lot of effort, medication, and sexual activity, and about 70 to 80% of men get decent erections back at the end of two years, but about 50% need Viagra or one of the other drugs. So that's our experience with erections, and that's what you can expect. External beam radiation and brachytherapy don't affect erections um immediately the way surgery does but with time with the radiation damage and age things may decline um, everybody experiences in my experience urinary leakage to some degree after prostatectomy when the catheter comes out but in the long term less than half a percent of patients in our experience have needed a second operation to fix the incontinence so that's less of an issue agree uh, and then finally, the last question from the email uh, was, I would like to know if a plant-based diet can improve the PSA numbers on the prostate and can it prevent further progression? Also, is the Cleveland Clinic currently doing a study regarding diet and prostate cancer? Um, I think, you know, this is a difficult question to answer. I think there's been a lot of studies that have looked at micronutrients, uh, such as plant-based diets, uh, you know, lycopene, uh, various other micronutrients and their effects on prostate cancer prevention or prostate cancer progression. Uh, the problem is these studies are difficult to interpret at times. What we do know is that there appears to be an association uh, with prostate cancer with the Western diet, and that diet is, uh, you know, associated with higher consumption of red meats, uh, higher dairy consumption, and, and that the, the uh, diets that are more plant-based appear to have a lower risk of prostate cancer. Um, the problem is, again, this is difficult to study, uh, and so, uh, I'll, and, and the effects of these micronutrients are probably not going to be seen uh, in a matter of months, but these probably are effects that uh, occur over your, 
you know, several years or your lifetime. Uh, that being said, uh, I always tell my patients that, uh, you know, I don't discourage uh, dietary changes, uh, but I think uh, you have to be realistic about the effects. But uh, I think I always say that what's good for the heart is good for the prostate. So you want to eat a healthy diet low red meat uh, consumption as much as possible, uh, minimize potentially dairy and, and, and increase uh, plant-based uh, diets. Uh, Eric, do you say anything different to your patients? No, that's a, I use those exact same words. What's good for your heart is good for your prostate. So eat plants, that's the healthy, healthiest thing. Correct. And, and are there any studies looking at uh, diet and prostate cancer at the Cleveland Cl Clinic currently? We, we currently don't have one. Uh, David Levy, who practiced at Euclid Hospital, was doing one, but uh, he left us. So we do not currently have any studies. Having said that, we just have hired a PhD um, who is going to be looking into nutritional aspects. So stay tuned. There'll be some new studies coming. Excellent. And it looks like the, the chat is open and there are several questions. Yeah, lots. <laughs> uh, what, one question that uh, I see here in the chat that I get asked a lot in clinic is, can cancer spread faster due to biopsy? Um, Eric, what do you tell your patients about that when, you, when they ask you that question? Uh, it's, there's no risk there. There's absolutely no evidence over many, many decades of doing prostate biopsies that a biopsy makes the cancer worse or can spread it. Correct, and I say the same thing. And I think, but we do hear that a lot, so that's a common uh, misconception uh, out there. So, uh, let's see here. So screening based on family history, what's of concern? You know, it really depends on your family history. If your uncle Joe had prostate cancer at age 75, that's probably not a genetic syndrome. If you have two brothers and a father with prostate cancer, that's a really significant uh, family history, especially if they were diagnosed with prostate cancer under the age of 60 or so. And, and so our threshold for recommending an MRI and a biopsy will be lower, maybe a PSA of two and a half. And we might also recommend what's called germline genetic testing, sort of a 23andMe approach, but in a more scientific fashion, using a saliva sample or a blood sample to determine if you carry one of a few genes that increase your risk of prostate cancer. Yep. I also see a question about uh, fairly steady uh, 0 0.1 PSA after prostatectomy, eight, 18 months after surgery. Uh, I think the fact that it's steady is is certainly reassuring without knowing all the details about the case and, and the grade of disease and the stage of disease and the margins at the time of prostatectomy, uh, it's it's hard to give a you know a complete answer here. But in general, if the PSA is stable, that indicates that there does not appear to be any residual, you know, at least uh, aggressive prostate cancer that is growing, uh, and that probably can be observed. But again, it's hard to give an uh, you know a, an opinion uh, without knowing all the details of the case. Agreed. There was a question about whether ISO PSA is ever done with a PSA under four, and the answer is no. The test is not validated for PSAs less than four, so it's validated for PSAs between four and 100. And if you have an ISO PSA test drawn, the first thing that's done is a repeat total PSA, and sometimes that comes back less than four, and so the ISO PSA is not done then. Um, and that's okay, because if your PSA went up over four and a repeat test shows that it's below four, you probably don't have prostate cancer. Correct. <clears throat> is a, a PSA greater than four considered elevated? Again, this is, that's a complex uh, question. Uh, you know, it's ele elevated, but may not be elevated uh, due to cancer. It could be elevated due to BPH, uh, prostatitis. Uh, there's an age associated increase in uh, PSA, probably because prostates tend to get bigger with age. Uh, and so there was a time when we considered doing uh, age based PSA cutoffs. Uh, but in general, we don't use strict cutoffs uh, by themselves. You know, we put it all into context of the patient and their risk and their family history and the, the change over time. And, and then we may add some additional tests such as the ISO PSA or the MRI to, to better risk uh, assess you and then determine if there's enough risk that we would proceed with a biopsy. All right, 
question about anti-inflammatory measures and foods and fasting, and can that affect, uh, can that have a positive effect on the prostate? You know, there aren't really any studies on that particular issue. There's a lot of epidemiologic observational research that suggests that statins reduce the risk of getting aggressive prostate cancer, but no one's ever done the prospective randomized study where half the patients get a statin and half get placebo to really prove the point. Um, but if you're on a statin, that's probably a good thing. Other anti-inflammatories, there's really not any data on that particular issue. So the best thing, again, is probably the best thing for your prostate is live a healthy lifestyle. Diet and exercise do make a difference for all cancer risk and for cardiac risk as well. And don't smoke. Those are the main things that you can do to uh, positively impact your health. Absolutely. All right, there's a question about undergoing hormone and radiation treatment for stage four cancer. And after radiation treatments, what sort of screening is required and what time frame? So generally we would check, uh, you know, PSA is the way to monitor that disease. And generally we would check a PSA probably every four to six months, um, depending upon how the initial uh, response was. And then, at least in my practice, I generally don't recommend any imaging studies unless the PSA is going up. But there are some of my medical oncology colleagues who will recommend um, routine uh, scanning uh, periodically, even if the PSA is stable, to see what's going on. There's a new PET scan available now called PSMA PET, which is the best imaging study that we have currently for prostate cancer, and it might be appropriate in your particular circumstance. So you might. Ask your radiation oncologist, your medical oncologist about that. Rob, do you have any thoughts about how you follow these patients? No, I think what you're saying is correct about uh, yeah, every four to six months, uh, depending on the risk, of course. And, and as long as the PSA is stable, you can uh, space it out as well. And as long as they're doing well without side effects, um, usually is, is. And we, we, we share the uh, visits with the radiation oncologists um, as well to make to make sure that uh, you know we're both seeing uh, the, the patient and, and addressing all of their uh, side effects and, and, and cancer risk. Uh, how do you balance the risk of secondary cancer to uh, secondary to external beam radiation and metastasis of prostate cancer? Um, you know, I, we didn't mention this, but there is a small risk of secondary cancers after radiation. Those tend to occur uh, several years after the radiation treatment. Uh, there is a, a higher risk of uh, rectal cancers as well as a higher risk of bladder cancers in patients undergoing radiation. Uh, the relative risk is about two to three times, but the uh, but the absolute risk is, is still relatively low. So it, it, the, your, your risk of prostate, uh, excuse me, secondary cancers are low, but they're higher than average uh, risk. Uh, and so I think you'd wanna make sure that you, you get your uh, screening for colorectal cancers uh, and notify us of any symptoms such as blood in the urine or blood in the stool, which may need further investigation uh, to see if there is an issue uh, with secondary cancer uh, in that situation. For sure. And uh, they, uh, they're asking if there's any good source of information about managing long-term side effects of radiation. Uh, Eric, do you, do you recommend anything specific to patients? Yeah, I, you know, uh, probably the best place is the Prostate Cancer Foundation website. They have a really fantastic uh, treatment guide to prostate cancer at all levels, early diagnosis and and uh, active surveillance and all sorts of treatments. Um, the other place you might check is the Radiation uh, Therapy Oncology Group, RTOG site, or the American Society of Therapeutic Radiation Oncology, the ASCO, ASTRO, A-S-T-R-O website. They all have good information. Great. And I see a question about whether there are things like uh, diet that uh, mask a true PSA level. There aren't any direct dietary interventions that affect PSA. Um, there are two things that do though. Statins tend to lower PSA and drugs called 
5 alpha reductase inhibitors, finasteride and dutasteride, which go by um, three trade names. Propecia is low, is low dose finasteride that's used for baldness. Um, Proscar is full dose finasteride that's used for BPH and urinary symptoms. And Avidart is the trade name for dutasteride. All of them cut your PSA in half. And as long as you, your doctor knows that you're taking them, whether it's your primary care physician or urologist, that's not a problem to interpret. Uh, let me get back to ISO-PSA for a minute. One of the advantages of ISO-PSA is that it's not affected by the use of finasteride or dutasteride or any 5-alpha reductase inhibitor. So you don't have to adjust your PSA for that. That's not true for prostate health index and OPCO 4K. You, you should not have those if you're taking a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor. And that's why I think another reason ISO-PSA is, uh, is clinically more useful. Let's see what else we have. I don't see any more questions on my end. Nope. I don't, I don't see any more questions coming have, into me either. I think we have them. Is this presentation available for later review? Yes, it's been recorded and it's going to be posted to our website. And I don't know if you'll be able to download it, but you should be able to view it online. Download will not be available. Okay, so you'll be able to view it online. And uh, I'm pretty sure it's going to be at the website that um, is on the screen, clevelandclinic.org prostate cancer care. All right, very good. Let's wrap it up there. Any final thoughts, Dr. Abawasli? Uh, no, I think we covered it all. I think it's pretty exciting. We've made a lot of advance in uh, prostate cancer screening, and I think we're doing a lot of exciting things at the Cleveland Clinic, and uh, I think we, we're improving care. I think we're minimizing the risks, and, we're in, uh, and we know that there is a benefit to screening. So I think we're shifting that balance uh, towards uh, prostate cancer screening, and, and uh, so I think that's, that's encouraging. Yep. I agree. Well, thanks, everybody, for joining. And you can see where you can reach out to us if you have other questions. Have a great evening.